We saw when we examined the Langmuir isotherm that as the concentration of adsorbate increased, more of it was adsorbed onto the adsorbent material. So let's look at an example where we have some solid adsorbent material. It's not specified what it is, some sort of powder that adsorbs CO. So the carbon mon monoxide is going to be the adsorbate. And we have just two data points. So we do it at a high concentration, low concentration, and saw how much absorbed. We're going to use that to characterize this, this interaction. How strongly does carbon monoxide interact with this particular adsorbent material? Note that the problem asks for delta G and the equilibrium constant in terms of a one bar standard state. That means we're putting the reactants in not as concentrations, but as pressures, uh, actually unitless pressures, the ratio of the pressure over the standard pressure. So in other words, plug the pressures in as bar. That means we're going to adapt the Langmuir equation. Instead of using concentrations, we're going to use pressures. And we're going to be sure to plug in those pressures numerically as bars. So we have 1 over the equilibrium constant. And then the adsorbate amount is going to be the pressure, the partial pressure of adsorbate, not the, uh, not the concentration. OK, that's still going to be hard for us to plot. After all, I mean, we don't know what the surface coverage is. How are we going to measure that? So we're going to come up with a way to adapt this to make it so that this thing's plottable. So what we're going to do is say m is the mass of adsorbed CO2, uh, uh, carbon monoxide, and m star is the maximum possible amount of adsorbed carbon monoxide. And the second thing is not measured, but we'll figure out a way to get rid of that in just a second. So this one is. We did measure how much carbon monoxide was absorbed. So once we have these two variables defined, we can see that their ratio is, is going to be the surface coverage, right? So if M star is how much CO2 would be on the surface, how much carbon monoxide would be on the surface if it were totally covered, M divided by M star must be theta. OK, so uh, let's go ahead and plug those defini definitions in. So we're going to replace theta with M over M star. And we don't know what M star is. But what we can do is divide that both sides of the equation by M star. So now we have 1 over M is equal to 1 over m star plus 1 over m star times the concentrate times the uh, equilibrium constant for adsorption times 1 over the pressure of carbon monoxide. Okay, the great thing about writing it this way is that if we plot this as y is equal to b plus mx, we can see that we've got things that are observables, things that we actually measured in the lab that we're going to plot. And the things that we don't have are going to pop out of the fit. So they're going to come to us once we do a, a line fit. So what we have to do is, is plot the reciprocal of the pressure of gas. Uh, and then uh, as a function of that, we're going to plot the as the y as the y uh, variable. We're going to plot the reciprocal of the mass of gas that was absorbed. Normally, of course, we'd have a whole series of points, but in this case, we just have two. So let's look at that data. So we have our original data, and because we were asked to do this as a one-bar standard state, we right away converted the pressures to bar, and then we took the reciprocal of the pressure and the mass of azure gas to get these two columns. When we plot those as x and y, we get this slope and this y-intercept. And that's all we need to solve for our answers. OK, so we have our slope and our y-intercept. And we have our, uh, we have our equation so we know what the symbolic meaning of all these things are. So first, we take our y-intercept to get m star, so now we know what the amount of carbon monoxide would be that would be absorbed if we were to really crank up the pressure. So if we, really, if we saturated the surface with carbon monoxide, this is how much would be on the surface. OK, so that's our m star. Once we have m star, we can solve for k. So we know the slope 
I'm just going to write the words I'm just going to write the word slope rather than use the symbol m because we could confuse it with the mass otherwise. So the slope is equal to 1 over m star times k. So we solve for k. So k is just going to be 1 over m star times the slope. So we have 1 over m star, which we said was 0 0.53 milligrams. And the slope, we said, was 1.88. Oops, that's not right. And the slope, we said, was 0. 0.102 bar per milligram. So we can see that our units of milligrams are going to cancel, and we're going to have bar as our reciprocal bar as our unit here. And so that comes out to. eighteen point five reciprocal bar. Okay. So we want to find the standard free interchange for absorbing onto the surface. And for any delta G standard it's just negative RT times the log of the equilibrium constant. Now at first this might seem a little odd that we're plugging in a number with units into a logarithm. We know we really can't do that. We have to remember that um, really in all these equilibrium constants, we're not really plugging in pressures. We're plugging in the pressure divided by the standard pressure. So rather than plugging in two bar, we'd be plugging in two bar divided by standard pressure of one bar, which of course will give us unitless pressure. So really this is actually unitless. So we can plug it in. And we had negative uh, 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin. We had a temperature of 300 Kelvins and we had the logarithm of 18.5. Okay. So that is equal to a negative 7.3 times 10 to the third joules per mole, or a negative 7.3 kilojoules per mole. Using the same data set, we can get an additional parameter. We can find out how much area is available for adsorption on the surface of this powder. So it doesn't actually give us the total surface area of the powder. It just gives us the, the surface area of the powder, that portion of the surface area of the powder that's available for adsorption for CO2, so we could, or for CO. So we could call it the active surface area. So the specific surface area is just going to be something that's meter squared per grams. Okay, so how much area do you get on your powder for a specific mass of powder? All right, well we know what the mass of powder was and we know what mass, what the maximum mass of, of carbon monoxide could absorb, so we could figure this out. So what we want is the area over the mass of powder. we go back to the beginning of the problem statement, we have that the mass of powder was given as 7.8 milligrams. And the area 
Well, that's going to be equal to that's going to be equal to the maximum mass of CO that we could put on there divided by the molar mass. So that tells us how many moles of carbon monoxide we could put on the surface. And then we want to um, multiply that by Avogadro's number. That will give us the number of molecules of carbon monoxide we could put down at maximum pressure. And then if we multiply that times the area per molecule, we'll have the total amount of area. So let's do that. So the max mass we said was 0 0.53 milligrams. It's the maximum mass of carbon monoxide that could stick to the surface. We're going to divide by the molar mass of carbon monoxide, which we know is going to be 28 grams per mole. Okay, so first let's put the mass of carbon monoxide that we could put on the surface at, at, at really high pressures. Well, we're going to be converting this to moles, so let's just go ahead and put it into grams. So we said it was uh, uh, 0.53 milligrams, so we'll say 0.53 times 10 to the negative third grams of carbon monoxide. We're going to divide by that by the molar mass. So we know that's 28 grams per mole for carbon monoxide. We're going to multiply by Avogadro's number to convert from moles to the number of molecules. So 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd reciprocal moles. We're going to multiply by the area of each molecule, which we said was 16 angstrom squared. And let's convert this to meters squared right away, because we know we want an answer in meters squared. So we'll say that there's 10 to the 20th angstrom squared in one meter squared right, because it's 10 to the 10th, but we're squaring it, so that's why it's 10 to the 20th. And that's it, we're ready to get our answer. And we plug all this in, and we end up with the specific area being 1.82, oh, actually, no, we don't. And we need to also divide by our mass of powder. So we have 7.8 uh, times 10 to the negative third grams of powder, the powder being the adsorbent. OK, so we plug all that in, and we get 234 meters squared Per gram. And that might seem like a pretty big area. After all, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a lot of square meters, right? Beep, beep. And for a very, and for very porous materials, this is indeed the answer you would get. Just to give you a flavor of how big specific areas can be. If you had silica nanospheres, so nanospheres with R of about 100 nanometers. Those are small, so there's a significant amount of surface area. So this specific area for that material would be around 10. On the other hand, if you had something that's porous, so uh, something like uh, um, mesoporous silica. You could actually get, and you can get this by uh, making pores that are templated with micelles, for instance. This can be in the hundreds, so around 100 to 1,000. There's metal organic frameworks which have pores that are really on the molecular dimensions, and those can be greater than 1,000. And the record, as of the time that I wrote this, 
was around 7,000 meters squared per gram. And the reason why this is significant is that a lot of reactions occur on solid surfaces. And so uh, the more surface we get, the better we can make our catalyst. The other reason this could be useful is if we wanted to use uh, adsorption of gases as a way of storing gases. So for instance, uh, for hydrogen powered vehicles, one idea is to store the hydrogen on the surface of uh, something like a metal organic framework. That was way too 